All right. And it is 301. So I want to just say hello, Central Ohio. Thank you so much for joining me. Another edition of a brotherly conversation about health, wealth, and race in Central Ohio. Uh, we've been having some really good conversations so much that I get so many overwhelming people uh, reaching out to me on Facebook, on Instagram, in my inbox, asking me questions after the show. But this is your time to ask me during the show. And we got really exciting guests on today, Stephanie Hightower from the Urban League. If you don't know who Stephanie is, then I'm sorry, you've been living under a rock. Uh, she is one of the most dynamic leaders in Central Ohio. She is leading our Urban League and doing tremendous things. And I can't wait to hear from her and some of the things that she's been working on this year. It has been an absolutely uh, strong year for the Urban League and Franklin County is proud to call you partners in this fight and then in our work to make Central Ohio a great place to live, work, and raise a family. Uh, and then we've got Nana Watson joining us from the NAACP. As she says, the biggest, uh, the biggest, boldest, and baddest NAACP chapter. Um, she texted me earlier in the week uh, on my membership, it was, and it was late. And, and I texted her right back and paid my dues. And that's the kind of person she is. You know, She will text you and say, your dues are due right now. And, you know, uh, you know, she type person that might show up in your front yard uh, to get those dues that she has to. So that's how tough she is. But she's brilliant and smart and a great leader as well. And so um, she's having some difficulties joining in. Uh, but but we're going to get started because I want to be respectful of all the time and, and that you've given me today. And so thank you so much for joining us for another great conversation. Um, what I've been saying, Miss Hightower, is if you had 30 seconds to introduce yourself and let's say you was on a date. And somebody said, you got 30 seconds to say, this is who I am, this is what I am, this is why I am, and you got 30 seconds and that's it. And that will determine if you get a second date. And, and, and you want the second date because what's in front of you is something you're interested in. So if you had 30 seconds to tell us everything about Stephanie Hightower, what would you say? Thank you first, uh, Commissioner Boyce, for letting me be a part of the sisterly conversation today and not the brotherly. <laughs> and uh, for expanding it to the sisterly conversation, I would say if I had an opportunity on to be on a date, which anybody gonna take me on no date ever again, oh, um, come on down. is that I am, I consider myself a justice seeker and a social justice warrior. Hmm. Well, I'm gonna tell you if I, if you say that to me on the first day, I'd be like, oh, what have I got myself into? She be like, this <laughs> this is for real right here. This is, I gotta let me go. Let's regroup and come back for another day because that's heavy. But but it but it's true. So so with that being said, I know Nana will join us at any second, hopefully. But you know, but we've been asking the public, and I mean, 2020 has been a crazy year. You know, we started off with a global pandemic that shut down jobs and shut down just living in a way that we've never seen before. And then we had the tragedy of the murder of George Floyd. And we had seen it before with Eric Garner and Breonna Taylor and Trayvon Martin and so many others, but this was different. This was just a different feel. And it set off uh, a lot of unrest all across the country. And the Urban League has been right on the ground forever in this fight. So just tell me, you as a leader, you as a black mother, you as a black person, how are you feeling about where we are in America in 2020? You know, um, Kevin, that, that, and th that's a great question. Uh, you know, as, as, as someone who is, has been doing this work for, you know, over 10 years now, um, you know, I, like everybody else, uh, I have been angry. Uh, I have been disappointed. I have been frustrated. Um, but to see the culmination of, you know, 400 years of just systemic racism sort of be to, just to hit a plateau that we've never seen before, um, what it said to me was, you know, it is now time for us to take, meaning the Columbus Urban League, to take our rightful position um, uh, in, this, in, in, in this work and make sure that people know that we are here at the, at the tip of the spear. Uh, we are here to make sure that black people are served. Our mission says that we serve African-Americans unapologetically. Um, and so we are, have always been proud of that. We have always been a part of, of putting together programming to really deal with social justice. We know social justice is about fairness. 
We know that it is about opportunities and access to resources, to wealth, to political representation, um, and the privileges that everybody in our society if, uh, should have. And so now that people, we let me just say this, we've been in existence, Commissioner Boyds, for over 102 years, right? This, the, when, we, when we came into existence, it was because of Black folks who were migrating from the South. It was during the Great Migration. They needed jobs. They needed housing. They needed a great education. Um, they needed health care. Here we are 102 years later, and we are still at a tipping point. We need housing. We need jobs. We need health, uh, health and wellness. Um, why are we still struggling and fighting for those things that were in existence 102 years ago. We are now at a point where everybody's woke, okay? Yeah, yeah. Now, if, if you're not woke, or if you wanna keep pretending that you're not, you're going to be basically in the legal world, you're complicit to the continuation of systemic racism. And I am just so happy that young people in this country, young um, leaders like you um, are now stepping up to the did, plate. Wait, did you just call me young? You just call me young? Okay, all right. You know what you're right. Young young leaders like me. That are stepping I'm young. up. Because <laughs> you are that next generation, Kevin, that's going to take over from where the John Lewis's started. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we have to look to you and we've got, as a community, we've got we've to be encouraging to you. We've got to be supportive of you. Because if we don't continue this momentum, it's going to be 102 years from now, we're going to be back talking about yeah, these the same, same conversation. And so you sound like you're positive. You're feeling hopeful and good about the moment, I would say, based on what you, I mean, even though it sounds like we got wait, you know, some reconciliation to do, but you sound like this, it's it, it's positive though, right? Absolutely. It's, okay. it's, it's a different feeling. Like I said, we have Black leaders who are now, who are stepping up. Not to say that our Black leaders haven't stepped up before, but they can step up in a, in a different way. Um, than they had and, and not be fearful of not being reelected or worrying about what mm -hmm. the corporate community is going to say about them or because I think now for whatever reason, you know, Commissioner Boyce, you can be your authentic self. You can actually talk about black issues and and people know that they need to hear them. You know, we're going to come back to that because I, I really think that is a part of this new conversation, if, if it was new, if you will. But, but I know, Nana, is that you that joined us? It is I. I bring you greetings. But but wait a minute, though. Why can't we see your face? I mean, the whole point of this is to see your lovely face, you know, with your blonde hair and all, you know, we like all of that. We like to see the red glasses. And, you know, why, why can't we why can't we enjoy that? Well, let me just say, I appreciate all those lovely comments. I tried to get in Zoom. It wouldn't let me. I've just had technical challenges and I'm trying to be technical savvy, but obviously I am not today, but it's okay. Cause Kevin, you know what? It's a good day. It is a good day. <laughs> That's an inside <laughs> joke for us. That's an inside joke. So you're right. It is a good day. Um, it it's is a good, a good day. day in the, in the, um, in the infamous words of Ice Cube, it's a good, today is a good day. It's a uh, good day. <laughs> so, but how you feeling? I mean, we were just talking, um, uh, Stephanie, and for y'all who don't know, uh, Nana Watson is leading our NAACP, the biggest, boldest, and the baddest organization. Did I get that right? <laughs> oldest and the boldest. Oldest Civil and the boldest. organization in America. And, and, and we've got Nana Watson, who is doing a tremendous job leading, um, you know, just a, a catalyst of, of change and conversation. And the NAACP is right there at the forefront. But, but this year, let's introduce yourself. Let me give you that chance. I, I was saying to Stephanie, if you was on a date and you had 30 mm. seconds to introduce yourself to the person in order to get a second date, what would you say in 30 seconds to get that person to come back for the second date? Tell, tell us 30 seconds about you that would get the person to come back for a second date. I am unapologetically Black and I'm a civil rights advocate and I advocate for Black people. I yeah, I would I would call that. you back for a second date on that. Yeah, yeah. But I would be <laughs> like, I would be like, I gotta like prepare for that day. I gotta like, you know, I gotta make sure I gotta do a little his history reading and a little bit of make sure I'm on my game for that one. So okay. All right, that'll work. You 
said, how can how you going to take her out on a second date? And I said a similar thing. And you I don't said you a justice seeker. You said you're a justice seeker. If we on a date, I, you might not be, well, I might not be seeking no job just kid yet, but I'm just saying justice seeker <laughs> might be intimidating. That, did I just say that live on Facebook? Anyways, okay, all right. I'm just saying justice seeker is intimidating. And then she, you know, so anyways, all right. So I'm that being said that, now, though. let's dig into, let's dig into some of this. You know, 2020 okay. has been uh, an incredible year, uh, a global pandemic, uh, the tragedy and death of George Floyd, murder of George Floyd. Uh, and then we've seen it before with so many others. Um, and then even yesterday, you know, a, a scandal at the state house, you know, perhaps yeah. one of the biggest scandals in the history of Ohio. Uh, and then it's July, you know, I'm like, man, it ain't even, it ain't even August yet. But, but that being said, with all of this happened, how are you feeling right now? Do you feel optimistic? Do you feel pessimistic? Are you feeling good about these conversations? Or, you know, how are you, how are you feeling as a leader in Central Ohio? Well, you know, the NAACP has always encouraged a conversation about issues that affect our community. So I'm hopeful that our conversations will be real and we will address the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room for black folks are is health, education, uh, racism for sure. The NAACP has uh, seven game changers that we've been addressing and they are health, education, get out the vote, uh, economic sustainability, and the list goes on. So we just wanna to continue to have the conversation and to be real. How do I feel uh, today? Today's a good day, as I said, but some days aren't good. Um, the burden that um, all black people carry is heavy. It's a heavy load to carry, but I believe that we can lift each other up, lifting up rather than uh, talking down and being mean-spirited as we begin to address the issues in our community. You, you hit the nail right on the head, and I'm going to challenge both of you on this, on this notion of hope and energy. You know, there are some who would say, like they do with politicians, we get criticism every day. Um, but there are some who would say, well, you know, the Urban League and the NAACP are no longer needed. They are relics of, you know, uh, Stephanie talked about 102 <laughs> years. And, and let me first say, I would, I would argue tooth and nail and fight somebody over the idea that, uh, you know, we don't need an Urban League or we don't need an NAACP or they're not serving this purpose. But, but make the case, do we need to reinvent ourselves? And in, in, does the Urban League need to reinvent itself? Does the NAACP need to reinvent itself? Or is our core mission still the same? And, and, and if so, what do you say to the people, black and white, that say, you know, these are things of the past. We're talking today, it's about Black Lives Matter, or it's about, you know, some of these other organizations. Um, what do you say when people challenge you on, on that? If you, well, any, anyone, gonna, whoever wants to go first. I'm going to go first, Steph, because I'm the elder today. May I be that? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just let me say, um, all of those organizations that you mentioned, certainly we all need to work together. But you know, when all these organizations are gone, the NAACP and the Urban League will still be around. Mm -hmm. um, people are always going to talk about the Urban League and they're always going to talk about the NAACP. But you know what is so hurtful is that they personalize. Um, some people don't like Steph, some people don't like Nana. It is my hope that they would get past the personalities and, and help us address the issues that are affecting black people in our community. You know, I think, Nana, you, yeah, that, I think that, that is, I think Nana is spot on. I, I, but I will, I will always say this, <clears throat> you know, Kevin, you're absolutely right. We do have a new generation of organizations and I am, uh, excited that they do exist, that, that we do have Black Lives Matter. You're absolutely right. But we do programming here at the Columbus Urban League. And, and, and if in fact there wasn't a need for us, then we still wouldn't be around. What has happened, however, is, and I gotta say this gently, what we always do as a community is we are not supportive of our Black organizations. And I think that has been a history of Black folks. And so 
we think that we can go and allow people who don't look like us to deliver services to our black folks just because for so many years we think that the majority they are the end all be all and so then we push our black organizations aside because they're not getting the same amount of resources that the white organizations are getting um they they can't pay people the same you know black organizations and there's all kind of studies out here now that talk about how black led organizations have been discriminated against just like anything else, especially in philanthropy, that we don't have reserves, that we can't pay our people um, the same amount in the white organizations. So my hope now is, is that what folks will see is all of those folks who went to those white organizations thinking that they could be the end all be all for black people, what you're finding when you disaggregate that data is they haven't done nothing for black people because if they had done stuff for black people, we wouldn't be having these disproportionate numbers of black people that have high unemployment, black people where babies are, our babies are dying, incarceration rate being high for African Americans, employment rate being high. But that's because folks didn't believe in the black organizations and partly rightly so, because we, didn't, we weren't given the opportunity to have the resources. Now that folks like you are sitting in places now that we're getting resources, we're able to deliver the kinds of services that our community deserves and needs. And then we have a great partner like the NAACP who reiterates that and also is very supportive. We have, we have elected officials like you and the other two commissioners as well that, that see the value of the work because when you look at all these numbers that are being exacerbated out here, this is about black folks, this ain't about Latina folks, this ain't about, you know, people, uh, white folks, these are about black folks. Why are those numbers so bad, Commissioner Boyce? Because you haven't had authentic people serving our folks, people who understand, who know what, what, what our services are needed. And they're also making the decisions about what services our people need and not allowing us to do that. You're absolutely and, right. And you, and oh, go ahead, go ahead, Nana. You know, I got to get it off my mind, off my out, because I'll forget it, because I have so many things going around in this head. But, you know, I think it's a sad commentary for this community to now begin to challenge white folks. NAACP has been challenging them forever. And now all of a sudden, um, you know, we're challenging them. We need to have challenged them long ago. Mm -hmm. I know the NAACP has. Our favorite agency is United Way. And I'm just going to put it right out there. You know, what is United Way doing for black people? I can't tell. I don't know if anybody else can tell what they're doing. Uh, people continue to give to them. Nobody asks how many black people are they serving. No one asks, well, how much money is the Urban League getting from United Way? How much money is um, the, YM, the YWCA getting from um, United Way? No one has questioned that. Yet people continue to give to the United Way of Central Ohio. What we need to have is our own black United Way, not the one that's down there on 3rd Street. Because I asked the question, are you essential and are you relevant to the black community? Wow, that, that sounded like a call out to me. And I'm just saying, you know, um, we don't have to, <laughs> we're going right. to circle back around to that. Let me give a quick shout out to Mary Ellen O'Shaughnessy. Thanks for joining our, our clerk of courts. And, and it's so important. I like it when I see... Uh, all elected officials tuning in because it, 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 that's a sense of connection that they're trying to make. And I appreciate that and want to recognize her. Tom Katzenmeyer uh, at the uh, Arts Council, thank you so much for joining in. And then Charity Martin King was on last week. Uh, thank you so much uh, for tuning in. Uh, and then I want to thank my colleagues, Marilyn Brown and John O'Grady. I mean, they have been, uh, as you indicated, Ms. Hightower, committed to this conversation, to this cause. We started off in poverty, but we ended up in this place where we're really advocating, I think, in a different and deeper way around the elimination of racism. Uh, Ken Wilson has joined us and Kena Smith, our county administrator and deputy administrator. Thank you so much for tuning in, appreciate you. Let, let me zero in on a couple of things because this conversation about um, Black Lives Matter and the role that organizations are playing I want to read to you a statement from someone and I want to get your reaction, you know, because people say, well, all lives matter. You know, uh, it's not just blue lives matter. 
Brown Lives Matter. And, and this was the, uh, a quote that I think really summed it up in a good way. Tell me what you think of this. Uh, this is by Doug Williford. He says, if my wife comes to me in obvious pain and asks, do you love me? An answer of, I love everyone, would be truthful, but also hurtful and cruel in the moment. If a coworker comes to me upset and says, my father just died, a response of, well, everyone's parents die, would be truthful, but hurtful and cruel in the moment. So when a friend speaks up in a time of obvious pain and hurt and says, Black lives matter, a response of all lives matter is truthful, but it's hurtful and cruel in the moment. What do you think of that quote? So, so Nana, if I could go first, I, I, I will say sure. that we, we, our community has been hurting for 400 years. Our, our Black people have been hurting in this country for 400 years. And so <clears throat> you're absolutely right. All lives do matter, um, but we have been hurting for 400 years and nobody has heard us. Nobody has wanted to hear us. Nobody thought it was important to hear us. We have been marginalized. Um, we have been discriminated against. We have been, uh, uh, all of those ills and everything that, that, that you just mentioned, we have, this has happened to us discrimination for 400 years. And so, yes, I think it's time for us, you know, to be able to be unapologetic about saying that black lives do matter. When you still are comfortable with lynching and killing a black man in public in 2020, then that means that you don't think that our lives matter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, when, when you still see that nobody has been, no police officer has been indicted in Louisville, Kentucky for Breonna Taylor's murder, then that means that her life doesn't matter. When we have young children who are still in failing schools mm -hmm. in this community, then nobody's up in arms saying that, th that these Black kids' lives matter. When you have an infant mortality rate, of black babies dying, then obviously black lives don't matter because if they did, then we would be actively looking at what do we do? Not to say that we're not doing things, but how has it been allowed to get to this point? Mm -hmm. Is what my point is, if black lives really did matter, if we people were paying attention to what black folks really needed, then a lot of this stuff wouldn't be as bad as it is. Um, so yeah. 400 years is time to be able to say we matter. Absolutely. Nana? Yeah, I, I think Steph summed it up uh, very, very eloquently, as she all, always does. And I, it begs the question for me, do Black Lives Matter? Yeah, I mean... And I'm going to leave it there. You know, and I, and I, I really That's feel like... Um, we're in a time where the question has been called, you know, we get so much into procedure and process. And I think the question has been uh, put on the table and, and, and America is asking itself. Uh, and, and the response has been good so far, uh, but it's more than um, protests and unrest and demonstrations, it is action. You know, and I always tell people, you know, you can't legislate morality. At the end of the day, change is gonna start with individuals. It's going to start with person to person, neighbor to neighbor, uh, and people getting rid of their own issues and hangups around racism. And I think if we do that, you'll start to see uh, things change. So I, I get this question, and I'm sure you all have gotten this during this time. Um, have you had any a white person come to you and say, what can I do? Like, what can I, what can I do? Stephanie, what can what can I do to change? You know, Nana, what can we do? What can what can we can we work with the NAACP? And what is it? What do you tell them when when they ask you that? First of all, has someone asked you that? And secondly, what do you say? Well, certainly, um, I don't have no white person has come to the NAACP and said, "What can we do to help?" Really? Uh, oh man, okay. I'm gonna start sending well, people yes, away. Yes, I'm gonna start Nana, sending yes, people away. Have. Nana, <laughs> what? Yes, they well, have. Well, they have, and he said, if white, he said, if white people come to the NAACP and ask, can we help? And I told him, no. 
Now, I will say that corporations uh, have have knocked on our door, but you know, mm-hmm. I want them to knock. But where? Why didn't you knock many years ago? Now you're feeling guilty, so you want to knock. So the answer to that is yes and no. So, so do you think though? When do you think it's good though? They are coming to the table now. They may not have done it historically, but but it's time that you know they change their ways. It's time that you know what I, what I say to the corporates. I say, okay, I want to see black people on your leadership. I want to see black people on your board. I want to see you engage and in investing in the black community. I want to see jobs where you you're trying to diversify your organization. And uh, and I think it's good that they're asking the question. And I think it's good that they're engaged. So at least at least they're you know, starting to have the conversation to even ask you, right? Yeah, that, that's a starter. Um, we've been, uh, NAACP has been around 109 years. I've been the president, I think, for, for four years. And this is the first time that they've even reached out. Mm-hmm. And uh, memberships uh, continue to come in. And that's fine. But it still begs the question, where were you prior to? Has this made you uh, guilty for not uh, giving to the black community is it your conscience Mm -hmm. that's bothering you if so that's okay now when you give to um you give to the NAACP if we receive money from corporation that does not mean that we're in your pocket because we're always going to ask how many blacks do you have in higher middle and entry level how much money do you spend with black businesses do you have a diversity plan and the other thing is who monitors it to see that you're in compliance? All of those questions. Uh, NAACP has been asking those questions for four years and um, just sent out an email today. In fact, uh, Commissioner, this is relating to the, to the jail, just sent out a letter asking um, some individuals, um, how many blacks do you have in your company? So I'm glad that they're asking a little too late, but we'll accept it. Okay, Stephanie. So, uh, you know, yes, um, I have had uh, many uh, folks from the majority community um, ask me, how can we help? And um, so, you know, I've I've taken a little bit different approach um, than my colleague at the NAACP, Ms. Jones, um, because (laughs) now what I want to do is now that you are woke, now that everybody's woke, how do we, my, my, my suggestion to them and my question back is, how do we sustain this momentum? What I want to do is I want to work with you to sustain this momentum. And so to what you just said, Kevin, you know, we know that probably 51% of, of minority owned businesses are not going to make it through this pandemic. And so how do we begin to look at your businesses and how do we connect you with those small businesses so that they can be you know, maintained um, because you may not have them on board? How can we help you with recruiting uh, talented African-American professionals to be a part of your leadership teams? Uh, how can uh, we work on um, uh, developing neighborhoods uh, so that we can, our children can, can, don't have food deserts. So there are all kinds of ways, you know, how do we look at philanthropy different in this organization, in, in this community? Um, and so uh, we want this to be sustainable. So whatever the, whatever it is you want to do, you know, we want to have real volunteers. I just got off the phone, uh, off the Zoom call with a, a law firm. You know, when we have expungement clinics, you know, we don't want to, have those and only three attorneys from legal aid show up how can your firm come in and be a part of those so that we know that a spongement clinic you sponsor it it's life-changing for ex-offenders if they can get those those records expunged and we need to we need to figure out how we can do one sooner than later now because people need jobs um how do we take our young interns um in these corporations when we have our summer program that the commissioners and, and County Administrator Wilson and Joy Bivens put money into after you guys appropriate it mm-hmm. and take these kids and put them and expose them. That's what I said about social justice. It's about exposure, right? Um, leveling that playing field. So how do we put those kids in a summer program where those corporations pay their wages and give them an experience that it would expose them 
to a corporate environment or mentors that they've never had before. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm looking for from our community. That mm-hmm. is not just a one shot deal to Nana's point about, okay, I'm feeling guilty or what can I do? I don't want this to be anything about guilt. It's about long-term, how do we turn systemic racism into being non-existent by opening up our hearts and opening up also our pocketbooks and wallets and making sure that necessary resources are being put in the black community. And I said this at a meeting somewhere and I think Commissioner Brown heard me say it. It can't just be incumbent upon the public sector to be the only ones that are making huge investments into the black community. The private sector has to come on board as well. You know, I don't have individual donors like other organizations, you know, like, and I don't mean to like the arts organizations. I don't have donors like that, but how do I get donors like that who want to put money into black and brown children or black and brown services? So it's, we got to make sure it's sustainable. We don't just want to have a one hit. We need this to be ongoing because this pandemic has exacerbated the issues that already existed in the black community. And when those stimulus checks run out and when the $600 a month extra unemployment is no longer available, and if there's no more PPP money for small businesses, we know that the unemployment rate, that the housing stabilization money that you guys helped and put into place, there's gonna be more people that are gonna be flooding the homelessness system. There are gonna be more people that don't have jobs. There are gonna be more people coming to see Joy Bivens to get on some kind of public assistance. This stuff is not over and COVID just exacerbated it even worse because in our, yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in our business, we know that black folks are the, the last ones hired and the first ones fired. So we know that there's a lot of folks out here on the rolls We've seen them when they come in for the house yeah, and yeah. Place money. They're going to be hurting come September. Mm-hmm. And I need for the majority community to think that when September rolls around, I don't need you to go back to sleep. I need you to stay woke because that's right. when I'm going to need right. you even more in September. So I've got a couple of questions that have come in online. And I want to give uh, some of our viewers a chance to weigh in on this with their questions to the panelists. And so um, I'm going to just take them as they came in. And if we, you know, uh, we'll ask for short <clears throat> answers so that we can get to all the questions, because I got like four of them right here, and I want to make sure we get to all of them. So the first question is, and I don't have who sent it, but it says, uh, when people say Blacks are playing victimhood today, what is your response? This is a question online from one of our viewers. When, when people say Blacks are playing victimhood today, what is your response? I mean, I got an answer for that, but I'm gonna give it to the panelists. Uh, uh, so uh, I'll let y'all, and just say it like it is. Say how you, you know, t- tell it like it is. Repeat the question, Kevin. Yeah, it's, I, I know, it's you, you, you wanna make sure you heard it right, right? So it says, when people say- Yeah, I say, do wanna make sure I heard it right. <laughs> when people it say is. blacks are playing victimhood today, what is your response? Well, why are they saying it? What do they have to back that up? Those are just words. What do they mean? Well, that's my answer. Mm-hmm. I, already, I, okay. I already said, Nana, we have been victims for 400 years. So I, you know, I, I that's the only way I can respond. I, you know, when you look at, you know, Commissioner Boyce and, and, and Nana, the, 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 the mental health, the, the, that has, has how, how mental health for us in this community, the level, how discrimination really does deal with our mental health, you know, if you're discriminated against every day of your life, if you go to a restaurant and you're not being served properly, if you know, we have to tell our black children, our black boys that they have to worry about driving down the street and being stopped by police. If when you have that level of stress on you every single day as a black woman, because I speak loudly or whatever, I'm now an angry black woman. When, when you have all of those things that are on you every day, we can't be our best selves because that's, that, that, that messes with our mental health. So we have been victims. I don't know if there are some people who are gonna play this to their, absolutely, that's gonna be in any situation, but we have been victims. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, 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 
a little get a little confused by the question because I, I feel like whenever you when you, when you look at a people who their ancestors were ripped from their home and shipped overseas and then put in bondage and slavery for hundreds of years, the residual experience from that and the embedded um, uh, institutional racism that was established in the very beginning of this country's history, and that's just a fact, you know, to, to say there's a victimhood element, I, you know, I would I would strongly disagree and say that I think I think that America is reconciling itself. That I think that it over time it's going to take us, you know, as you said, you know, slavery existed uh, for hundreds of years, and we've been out of slavery as Black people in America for less years than we were in slavery uh, in American history. And to unwind those institutional racial elements that were embedded in post um, slavery into Jim Crow laws, uh, into, so, into what we deal with today, I, I think it's not victimhood. I think it's America reconciling, you know, being a better country, being a better democracy, allowing equality to truly exist and seeking what our founding fathers sought out to do. They didn't get it right but they embedded that in our constitution for a reason and it, and it allowed for, the reason was to allow it to evolve. And so I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't think it's a victimhood as much as it is America is speaking. When you look at the protesters out there, if you've been out to the, I know y'all been out to the protest, both of y'all, they, they've been as, as much white as they have been black. It's, it's been as many white people out there, black people. And I think what Americans, what Central Highlands are saying is we are tired of this too. And I, and I may be white, or I may be this or that, but I'm tired of this too. We are all equal, we're all humans, and let's all exist and coexist in a way that we can be the best humans that we can be. And I, and I really believe that. Um, so we got a ton of questions coming in, so I wanna make sure I give a chance to get to these folks' questions. The next question was, do black organizations partner and what stops us from working together? Oh, I, I like that one. Um, I'm gonna, I've always said this, that the Urban League has the programs and the NAACP advocates advocates for those programs. We advocate on behalf of Black people in this community daily. Uh, everyone is welcomed uh, at the seats. At, everyone in this city is welcome to join the NAACP. Um, and for some reason, uh, which is unbeknownst to me, I guess it goes back to what I said before. Some people just don't want to sit around the table and, and talk about issues and see how we can resolve them as a family. NAACP addresses policies and procedures, not individuals. And we change, we like to think that we change policies and procedures in this city to make it better for Black folk. Yeah. Stephanie? Yeah, and I would say, you know, Commissioner Boyce, I, I do want to go back to something real quick when I answer this question first. Yes, we love to partner. Absolutely, partnerships are essential, but we want to be equal partners, all right? Mm -hmm. And so what we find is usually when somebody wants to partner, they are been given the dollars to actually do the work, and then what they give to us to do is say, okay, now I need you to come up with your hand to the black mm -hmm. See, that's not, that's not real partnering. OK, right, right. If you really want to be an equal partner. What you do is when you develop whatever the concept is that you want to partner, you come to us and ask us at the front end to say, what does a partnership look like? Mm -hmm. See, I'm not interested in the crumbs anymore. I want the whole loaf just like uh, the other partner does. So mm -hmm. how do we figure out where you get a half and I get a half, but we're not willing to continue to accept crumbs? Okay. Now, I, want to go, I want to go back to the slavery piece. So you're saying. 200 years of slavery. See, Jim mm -hmm. Crow is slavery. Mass incarceration, you know, as Michelle Alexander will tell you, is slavery. Okay. Redlining is another uh, 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 institution of, of slavery. So that's why I say we've still been slaves. Yes, we may not been in the slavery of the bondage and the chains coming over across the water. And I think that's one of the things that somebody can ask a question about playing the victim. See, there's a difference between immigration and there's a difference from being a slave. When you, when, you're, when you are taken away from your roots and your ancestors and all of that is being stricken away from you, that's a different mindset and has a residual impact 
from somebody who has made a conscious choice to come to this country and be a part of it. So again, that's why I say we're victims. Yeah, and let's, I gotta, I'm gonna try to get through some more of these questions because I wanna be mindful that the people who have taken their time to view, to sit with us and view today, uh, I wanna try to get to some of the questions. Someone asked a question about uh, Franklin County declaring racism as a public health crisis. And, and let me just kind of preface this with, we spent, the, and both of you worked with us on this, we spent the better part of a year peeling back the layers on poverty and looking at why some people in Central Ohio and some neighborhoods and communities are flourishing and growing and prospering, yet others, it's the, the tale of the two cities, you know, tale of two counties. Others are going the exact opposite direction. Poverty is growing, housing is harder to get, public transportation is non-existent. There is no access to healthcare. And so, and when you look at all of these social determinants of health and the long-term viability of what it means to be black in Central Ohio, um, we thought the value was rooted in declaring racism as a major component to why some communities are not thriving and others are, some people are not uh, th thriving and, and others are. And so what's your reaction to that question when folks say, what, what does this mean to declare racism as a public health crisis? I think you just answered the question, Commissioner Boyce. I don't need, you I mean, you, I don't need to reiterate all of those things because that is why I thought it was, we think it's important to declare it because now we've brought attention to it. Now it's been legislated. We know that that's how things get changed is when they are legislated. When it just sits on a back burner and doesn't have any teeth in it, then things don't change. And so kudos to you and the commissioners for legislating it. So now that it has teeth in it, now resources can be put to it, a focus of attention, the poverty study and all those things have a different meaning now because you've legislated it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and let me just say, John O'Grady and Marilyn Brown have been uh, champs and partners to work with, and they're fully committed at every level. I mean, when we get into private uh, closed door rooms, they're still committed. And that's the real, that's the real test. Uh, Nana, what, what's your, what's your thoughts on this uh, declaration of racism as a public health crisis? Well, why shouldn't it be declared? Who's asking the question? Why shouldn't we declare it? It's the truth. So I, I don't even understand the question. Why, why shouldn't we declare it? Racism is the elephant in the room, and it's always going to be uh, until and as long as we see it as, as the elephant and we don't address it. And kudos to the commissioners, and you know NAACP likes to monitor everything that you all put forth, so we're going to be monitoring that as well. But um, That's right. we need, That's again, right. we need to, you know, we love to monitor things, and we like to drill down as a uh, one of the members of the NAACP says, we'll drill down so we can't drill anymore. So it begs the question for me, why shouldn't we declare it? To whoever yeah. asked the question, I want to ask them, why shouldn't we? Hey, you, whoever asked the question, you heard it. You, you know, hey, you, you, can, you can inbox <laughs> me, we can talk about it, but uh, the question was put right back on. So we got four more questions that have come in and I want to try to get to these. We got like 15 minutes and I want to, they're still coming in, good, good audience watching today. Thank you so much. So Charity Martin King asked the question. Uh, she, she got her name to it here. It says, what legislative effort is occurring and how can the people support? The, the one thing I'll throw out, I, I ask you to, to join in too, is that right now at the state house, we've asked our state to join us in this declaration <laughs> and to help us on a state level because, because I was on a show earlier today and they asked me about what, the, what it meant to, to make the declaration. I said, the, the core element is, is that it's a value proposition. It, it says that, this is what we value as an organization and institution. And, and going forward, everything we do is gonna be rooted in that value. Mm -hmm. And from who we hire, what companies we talk to, where we invest our money, mm -hmm. just go down the list. And, and so that value proposition is critical. But um, and the state's got their legislative effort. And I don't remember the, the House, the Senate bill right now, but I know uh, Erica Crawley, Herschel Craig, and uh, Senator Sandra Williams out of Cleveland are all uh, leading that effort. But, but do you know of other legislative efforts or policy conversations? No, but I, I, I think, you know, not, this is again, because you all have legislated it, what it is giving all of us is an opportunity to start poking holes and looking at um, a legislation, not only that the county has, but even across the state, when we look at housing legislation, you know, we do have our Congresswoman Joyce Beatty that 
we, you know, lean heavily on. And so, you know, she's going to be helping us with those legislative areas that we need to look at long term to look at housing, to look at employment, to look at, you know. And by the way, she's got a bill in Congress getting there Congress to declare uh, racism as a public health crisis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nana? I mean, Nana, yeah, you, were I, I at the, you were at the mayor's press conference the other day and spoke. So talk a little bit about what the city, their legislative efforts and what they're doing. Citizens Review Board. Um, you know, the NAACP held a press conference uh, last month, and we requested that a Citizens Review Board be established with subpoena power. Um, the city of Columbus heard our call, as, as other um, organizations did. I think this is a start. Um, we don't know how it's going to look uh, because there's a working group that has been uh, established and Steph is on that as well as the NAACP. We don't know how it's going to look, but I know that it's a step in the right direction. And I do know that we need police reform in the city of Columbus and, and the mayor is putting on the ballot or the council uh, a, char a change in the charter so the Citizens Review Board can be established. Yeah, and, and so and I, you know, again, I, I, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead, Nan, I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm think, I think the key for all of this is to vote. Everybody needs to be registered and they need to vote. That's one of the things that NAACP is laser focused on. We have got to begin, we've got to vote. We got to know what the issues are. We have to know who we're voting for and why we're voting. We just can't go in the voting polls and just push a button blindly. We have to educate uh, ourselves and the NAACP is going to be doing that. We're going to be talking about what this charter amendment means, what the citizen Bless review board means. So we're gonna have a lot of conversation and I don't wanna just keep talking because you said you have a lot of questions. Well, no, I, I, I'm glad you did though, because I mean, the NAACP has been advocating for citizens review board for decades. Uh, as long yes. as I've been an elected official, and, uh, and I just, I, I think it's so, uh, it's telling that we're at a stage in a Central Ohio history where there's really action being taken. And I think that's a good thing. Um, these next two questions are really directed, I think, at the Urban League um, because they, they're, they're programmatic, but maybe the NAACP too. I, I, I might be wrong about that. The first one is, are there funds for mortgage support? And the second one is, how can we contact the Columbus Urban League about criminal justice Criminal Justice Expungement Workshop and learn more. So th there's two questions that came in. Sure. So the 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 expungement clinics. Um, I was just on a call, like I said, with the law firm. Um, I need to um, get um, with Michael Daniels. We we're supposed to be talking because now, I mean, COVID's not going away anytime soon. But we have to figure out. I think how do we put those clinics together? Um, and I'm sure uh, I'm sure you said that. Um, uh, Administrator Wilson was on, and I think he's been a part of that, uh, making sure that happens. But we need to go ahead and figure out how we do those with social distancing. Uh, but we can find a large venue where we can get people in because we know you can get anywhere from four to 500 people to come, and they're important, and we need to get those um, kicked up. So as soon as we can get through some of these little crises, yeah. we're going gonna, we're gonna to be looking at how do we um, have conversations with the county again to ramp those back up. Absolutely, um, we'll work closely with you. And then, and then the other question was mortgage support. So um, we, we, we do have, I think, a, a little bit of money left. Again, the county commissioners uh, put some money in. We have some private folks, uh, um, uh, Battelle and uh, AEP. Uh, and so if you can call our main number, 614-257-63300. And if you can ask for Rhonda Johnson or our housing, uh, there are, I, I believe there are still some a few funds that we have left in the pot where we can help you with your mortgage payments. Uh, there's also a fund I don't uh, at uh, and it's for housing uh, at Impact, and I'm not sure if it's for just rent or for mortgages. So so please don't quote me. Um, but they also have uh, a fund where they are helping uh, with I know with uh, in housing assistance. I'm not sure how much from a mortgage assistance, but we do have funds for mortgage assistance as well. And so that's impact, uh, um, I think it's .org. I think you can go to impact.org and get that information. So that that's helpful. And, and the county is so grateful for our partners like the Urban League and Impact that help us really 
connect to people who need resources. I know I've had constituent cases over time come in and both the Urban League and uh, uh, Impact have been tremendous resources to solve those issues. I'm gonna send this next question to you, Nana. Uh, it's from Stacey okay. Burke and it's, it says, how do we create a new model for healing justice that is effective and sustainable beyond the present day? Do that one more time. That was a mouthful. Stacey Burke says, how do we create a new model for healing model. justice that is effective basically beyond today? So he's saying, you know, you know, the, yeah, the environment's good, but how do we sustain this effort? How do we create a new model that once everything settles down, we're still digging into the work? I, I think, again, and I continue to say more conversation, more people involved in the conversation. I think um, the pandemic is just has created um, many, many challenges uh, for the black community as it relates to health. And I can go on and on with that. But I think people have got to come together. We've got to have a conversation when this is all said and done. Where are we going? We need input from the community. We need to hear their thoughts on it. It's just not up to the NAACP and the Columbus Urban League. We belong to the community. And as long as and I want this community to know that we're here for you. We don't operate in a silo. We want to hear from you. We want to understand how it is that you see it going and bring it to the table. And let's have, have an open dialogue about it. Yeah, I mean, and, and I would say that what you're saying is you can become a member of the NAACP and work with us to try to help solve this problem, to sustain this conversation and continue it. Stephanie, you got any thoughts on this? And I, I have one wrap up question and then we'll have final thoughts. But Stephanie, you got some thoughts on how do we sustain this I, I effort? Think, I think Nana has hit the, the nail on the head. You know, I said in an, in, in an uh, op-ed piece last, last week, this is about all of us being allies together. And that's the only way this work is going to get done and the momentum and sustainability is going to happen. And so continue dialogue, you know, being open um, to, to having dialogue. Um, the Urban League, that's what we want to be. If, if you have questions, that's why I said when people call me and say, what can I do? Let's have a real genuine dialogue, Commissioner Boyce. And, what, and that's what we're doing. And it's been amazing how we people are learning, you know, and they're, and mm -hmm. they're open to learning. And it's not about a, I got you or pointing the finger. It's about how do we work together to solve these issues? Man, that just that's spot on. That's spot on, and and I think you really is the perfect transition into the this final uh, point of discussion, and that's the census. You know, here we are in 2020, and with COVID-19, uh, uh, George Floyd um, uh, uh, controversy at the state house, um, we still have to take our decennial census and count the people who live in our community. And, and for those who are watching and don't know, um, over $34 billion, that's with a B, $34 billion comes to Ohio to support many of the conversations about the programs that we just had, you know, from housing, which I know the Urban League is very much engaged in, to um, access to quality and affordable health care, to our education system, to um, a variety, to public transportation. And, and, and so those funds come to places like Franklin County and allow us to do the things, they help us do the things that are important to address the quality of life. But if you both could talk for a couple of minutes about how what you know about the census and how it impacts the people you serve and the, uh, the um, policy issues that you champion. So how, 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 I, I, how much billion did you say, Kevin, again, comes to? $34 billion comes to Ohio. That, that right there in the form, it really says why we need to, and especially in our community, we're really asking people to sign that census because much of that $32 billion is going to be in our neighborhoods and or will be distributed to those neighborhoods that you're talking about that are underserved, that are misrepresented. So I just, we've been imploring people to please fill out the census because that's how we'll be able to change the landscape in the neighborhoods if people fill out the census. Mm -hmm. Nana, I, I know you all have been very active and engaged in this census conversation. Um, tell, tell us your thoughts about, you know, why should people be um, fully engaged with the census count? Well, I, I believe uh, NAACP believes that you've got to fill out those forms because as you said, all this money, it, 
we have the opportunity to improve Medicare for seasoned mm -hmm. citizens. And then when you look at um, the babies, you look at Head Start, you know, we encourage uh, parents that have babies, zero to five, we need you to fill out those forms so your child can continue to go to Head Start. Absolutely. We also need our black men to fill out those forms. Those are the two areas that that are lacking. I don't know why black men won't fill out the forms. I don't know why um, our mommies and daddies uh, are having a challenge filling out those forms. I will say the NAACP will be having yard signs put in the areas where there have been low census counts. And on one yard sign, it will say fill out the census and the other one will say register to vote. So, so, uh, Nan, so I would those are you said something that just yeah. made, had a thought. So I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking at my notes, and I don't see any mm -hmm. category for seasoned citizens. Um, what's who? What's a seasoned mm -hmm. citizen? <laughs> I don't see that category. What's <laughs> a what's like a seasoned that. citizen? T tell everybody what a seasoned citizen <laughs> is. <laughs> <laughs> a seasoned citizen would be Nana Watson. Anybody that's over uh, that's over fifty, because you know what, this community can depend on us to vote. And they can depend on a seasoned citizen to fill out those forms. Now, at one time, you could depend on us to be a poll worker. But I tell you this, we're not going to do that this year. Uh, the Board of Education needs 4,000 poll workers, and we're sending out a call to all young people, become engaged and be a poll worker, because we can't do it. Absolutely. So, and the state uh, that's, needs about 35,000, and we, we're doing the same thing. We need young people to come out and work those polls. And hopefully we're going to be working with the NAACP, not only around the census. And Nana, please make sure I get one of those signs in my yard. But we got to get people. I out will. We got to get people out to vote. And so how do we if we got to go carry people, put them in our individual mm -hmm. cars? That's what's going to happen. I'm, I'm telling you, because this year it's not going to be no joke. We got to get people out to vote. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you're really just spot on. And if you don't believe me. Uh, think of it this way, if you're watching and you don't believe me, for every person who doesn't count, that's uh, $1,200 that doesn't come into our annual coffers from mm. uh, of the census count. And, and so it's so critical to be a part of that. And then the other thing about the census, I just add, is that it matters how we're represented in Congress, too. You know, that's so right. it, it determines the number of seats that we have in Congress. And I can tell you, the portion of our country that's growing the fastest and the most is the Southwestern Corridor. And so while mm -hmm. Ohio is projected to possibly lose a congressional seat, it's states like Texas and California and Florida that are picking up seats. And the states that we are competing with right now as we speak, and it's gonna be a tight run, is gonna be Georgia and North Carolina. And for every seat that we lose, they could gain. And so it's so critical that we maintain our number of congressional representatives. And, and, and in the last census, that's how our current congresswoman was born, essentially, because yeah. when, yeah. when the seat shifted and Central Ohio grew in population, it, it ba basically consolidated one seat into a Columbus-based seat. And, and that, that's really the first time Columbus was represented in Congress. And we couldn't have had a better person represent us than Joyce Beatty, but, but she's been doing that. So, so to count on the census, you can go to 2020census.gov. That's 2020census.gov. Or you can call 844-330-2020. That's 844-330-2020. Today, you have been a part of a sisterly conversation on wealth. <laughs> health and race in Franklin <laughs> County. Um, two of my favorite people, my favorite leaders. I love working with them because they don't hold anything back. They call you out when, you, when you're wrong and they support <laughs> you when you're right. And, and that's how the relationship should be. And so I'm so excited for another edition of our conversation about Franklin County and Central Ohio. And I hope that you'll tune us, tune in again next week, same time, same place, three o'clock on Wednesday. And we're gonna have a great lineup once again Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I've been a pleasure to have you both. Hearts to you too. Thank Hearts you. To you too. Bye, guys. Thank and you so much for joining day. me, Central Ohio. Chat soon.